Get more confidence. Get that promotion. Get moving up the corporate ladder. Get a better gig with an MBA from Mays Business School at Texas A&M University. Whether you're starting out or stepping up, now you can take your career to a whole new level with a full-time MBA in College Station and convenient weekend options at Houston City Center. Texas A&M has a program to suit your schedule. Visit mba.tamu.edu. And Giga Maggie. Howdy. Welcome to May's Mastercast. I'm Shannon Deer, the Assistant Dean for Graduate Programs, here with your superb host, Ben Wiggins. What it do, Shannon? How you uh, How you been? Great. How are you? I'm doing all right. Weird great? COVID great or like regular great? Well, hmm, how, how to answer that? Both. Both. I'm doing both. Yeah. I mean, it's one of many kinds of privilege is being able to work from, you know, being able to work remotely privilege. And as I've probably said on the show before, most of our problems COVID related have mostly just been annoyances. And many people have felt, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people out there are dead. Um, I think millions worldwide now. And so, yes, it's, it's a very, very serious situation out there from a personal perspective. I'm doing, doing well. Sure. Yeah, I'd like to send good bull to Brian and Pat Barnes. Brian's mother passed away last week from COVID. And it's always tough to lose someone, but it is, I think, maybe a harder time to mourn because people are not oftentimes getting to go to funerals and things like that. So it just it just seems it's it's challenging. It's really tough. Yeah. But we're living in a place of gratitude and we are grateful today to have the Mastercast show. And to have Steve Tinkle on the show, he is a friend of the show, a friend of Ben and Kyle's. Uh, They're working on a few projects together. And Steve is just an entrepreneur's entrepreneur. Is that a good way to describe Steve? Yeah, great way. Steve has been called a cross between the most interesting man in the world and Tony Stark of Iron Man, which I think is a very good (laughs) description. He has collaborated on a New York Times bestselling book. He was a world-ranked competitive gamer. Ben, are you jealous? Very. (laughs) He took a team from top 5,000 to number eight in the world. He has lots of interesting experiences that run the gamut. He helped a NASCAR team go from dead last to second place in one season. He worked with the National Football League, Major League Baseball, and the NHL. He's worked on projects with Nolan Ryan, John Paul De Julius of Paul Mitchell Hair Care, tennis player Betsy McCormick and her husband Mark McCormick, the founder of ING, who was also called the most influential man in sports. Oh, and this sort of known, marginally known guy named Tiger Woods. Steve helps businesses when they get stuck to grow again. He's helped companies make billions, raise hundreds of millions. He probably has something to say that could help you as well on today's show. We hope you will listen with an open mind and we learned a great deal from Steve and and hope you do too as a listener. An open mind and hopefully open ears as well. We hope your ears are open. Like just take the cotton out of your ears and open them up. We should do a whole episode with that, no? With those voices? Yeah, we're pretty good at it. (laughs) Let's get into it. But don't worry, we don't on this episode. (laughs) Enjoy the episode. We welcome Steve Tinkle to the show. Steve, what's going on? Glad to be here. It's going to be fun. It is going to be fun. It is our pleasure to have you. How was how was your weekend? It was really wonderful. We, um, you know, during the this Corona situation, we have some family that was working remotely, and they were in uh, Ohio and decided to relocate the family for the summer to Texas so they can still work remotely. And then uh, all of our boys get to hang out together, and the families get to hang out together, and it's really, it's just been wonderful. That's great. What is your favorite superpower? So this has been discussed at length with. Uh, with our boys. Uh, we have two boys that are seven and nine. And while jumping on the trampoline, a lot of times we discuss what would happen if bad guys came What yeah. or, you know, power do we have? And I, right. I have landed on what we call copy. And with the copy superpower, I can 
basically copy your superpower. So whatever you have, it gives me the ability to fight that with you. Um, and we've discussed it in a lot of detail of do I copy it or do I steal it? And uh-huh. the decision has been, it would be unfair to steal it because that's not good storytelling. And so instead I copy your ability, but I'm at a st- distinct disadvantage because I haven't had time to master your ability. Mm. So see how it's nice that I can learn a lot of things. And we also decided if I've copied them, can I remember them so that I can reuse them in the future? And so there is a, like a build up phase of a couple of seconds. So I can't just immediately switch through, but I do have this library of infinite abilities that I've ever stolen. This is so precise. I love this. I feel like this, I feel like there's an, there's a new story here to be written because you see rogue in the X-Men and I'm sure there's someone in the DC universe that does the same thing, but I don't know if any of them get to keep the powers. So this is, this is a new one. Well, that, you know, we discussed it because Oliver was saying he didn't really care much for Superman. And when I asked why, because usually he's a, up there at the top, he said, because it's unfair. He, it would be very boring if you could never be defeated. And I said, well, that's why they had to introduce later ways for him to be defeated because it was getting boring. And so a lot of that type of real depth of character development has gone into understanding this copy power. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, how it can be used. Now, my initial response is the power that I take on really depends upon the type of reasons why I need a power in the first place. Uh, But yeah, it's been very well developed and uh, I really enjoy having this power. That's great. Let's get into some team building questions. Where did you grow up? I grew up in East Texas, what some people affectionately refer to as behind the Piney Wood Curtain. Behind the Piney Wood Curtain. Yeah. What is, is that just a reference to being sort of out there or? Well, if you actually, if you look at a map of the United States, it is referred mm-hmm. to as the Great Southern Pine Forest. Oh, okay. There are pine trees that grow in the South that extend, I, I will tell you specifically from Carthage, uh, Texas, all the way over to Carthage and Crockett, kind of in that area. You start seeing the trees and then it goes all the way east, um, you know, to, to the East coast. And so where I was in like Nacogdoches and center and, you know, the real Eastern part of the state of Texas, yeah, you're firmly planted within, you know, this Southern pine forest. And so some people refer to that as the piney wood curtain. Mm-hmm. You mentioned Carthage. Carthage was the team that lost the state championship in 1991 to the A&M consolidated tigers. Yeah. yeah that's, <laughs> connection there we may or may not know about (laughs) yeah i was i was at that game but uh tell us a little bit about your family so it was kind of a weird family for me my mother had married and remarried uh, several times to to people who i would say are were poorly chosen as life partners Mm -hmm. um the stepfather that I probably spent the most time with worked cattle for a living and he also would shoe horses uh to make money for our family yeah. Um, and so if you think about not just a rodeo, which I was a rodeo cowboy as well, um, I actually worked, you know, professionally with him, you know, at unpaid, I might add, uh, as a, uh, a helper for a professional cowboy uh, who, who would work cattle and we were around horses all the time, lived out in the country, as you can imagine. At one time I had 53 dogs that worked um, with him and his operation. And then my father owned a, a tire store, which he's owned, you know, my entire life. And then yeah. my mother, mother worked in sale barns selling livestock. Uh, and I would be there with her sometimes until two or three o'clock in the morning uh, at, you know, three, four and five years old, just being doing things that OSHA would not approve of. I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that answers the question about first job. So we'll skip, <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll skip past that. Um, what was, what was your greatest challenge as a child? Okay. So for me, the greatest challenge as a child was witnessing the death of my brother. So at, at eight years old, uh, I saw my six year old brother get killed. And at, you know, anytime something traumatic happens, you know, your, your body has a way of shutting down and, and, and hiding and protecting you from the emotional trauma that goes with that. And so that piece has stayed with me, not just through childhood, but through uh, my entire life as well. 
Yeah. I'm very sorry that happened. Um, I appreciate that. You actually don't, you don't have to be. It's what I have learned is that, you know, in life we all have challenges. You know, we, we don't always get to pick them in business. We do, we get to pick the challenges that we take on and then we get to address them. But sometimes life hands us things. Yeah. And you know, what's strange is I've actually seen someone who would go so far as to tell you that before we come into this world, we choose the challenges that we will face. And some of them that she has experienced in her life are quite daunting. And I don't know if that's a coping mechanism for her or or she really believes it to be true, but um, it was just my story and it was part of how I got started. And in some ways has, you know, been, I don't know if you would say it's been a blessing, but it has been part of my life experience at this point and, you know, have learned to make peace with it. You've commented that frequently entrepreneurs uh, grew up in some kind of instability or chaos. Um, Do you, do you think that that is, how do you think that applies to your situation? So in that specific situation, that's what I would call more of a traumatic event. Right. Yes. So again, during trauma, chaos was more about my mother and family and the way that, you know, she lived her life. Yeah. Um, I lived in 21 different houses by the time I was 18 years old, for example. Mm. Um, and so I never really firmly had like a, a friend group that I grew up together. You know, by the time you start to build friends, you were moving, you know, and there were a lot of different schools in there as well, different towns and things. And so it was hard to set roots. So it was, what I would say <clears throat> is I was born into chaos and very comfortable with it. By its very nature, I worked at one point with a gentleman who he lived on the same street his entire life. And he only moved once. And when they moved, it was three houses down on the same street. Hmm. And so he was very, um, very organized, very uh, detailed, meticulous, very stable, low change type person. Whereas for me, I was you know completely opposite in the other direction. And there were components of that that I needed to manage. But I was at an event in Silicon Valley once, and it was one of the, you know, one of the early investors in like Uber and and Twitter and some of the really big names that you would respect. He said, my observation about CEOs and founders of companies is that they are all, they came from traumatic uh, childhoods and that they're very comfortable with chaos. And I think the reason why he was saying that is he was talking to successful entrepreneurs and what's one of the things that I believe separates success from unsuccess in the entrepreneurial realm is your ability to navigate that environment that you're in. Yeah. And I believe business is chaos. It never goes as expected, uh, whether it's problems with staff or now with the market or with customers or with products or just unexpected things that you have to be able to deal with. Mm-hmm. And so Hollywood has done us a disservice by by painting this kind of Machiavellian picture of usually a man who's got it figured out and he wills this thing into the world. And usually it, it's, it's never, in my experience, I've never seen that happen. Um, it, it's always been a team usually of misfits who don't really know what they're doing, figuring it out. And in some cases, uh, I remember one gentleman who had built three companies and sold them all in excess of a hundred million dollars speaking to a group of entrepreneurs. And he said, first understand that I'm a fluke. Um, there's very, very rare to go three for three, especially at this magnitude. And he said, while you may want to give me some form of respect for what I've done, let me tell you very clearly, and very plainly that in every case, the thing that I sold, the thing that made me successful is not the thing that I thought I was building. <laughs> and I don't know what to do with that, um, except to, to maintain humility. That makes sense. Normally we ask for 60 seconds, but in your case, give us two minutes on your career road so yeah. far. Yes, it may take some time for that. Well, so early on, if you go back, you know, to the early, early career, you know, I worked cattle and helped shoe horses, you know, with my, my stepfather and then worked in some, you know, restaurants, um, washing dishes, for example, through a, a friend of my mom that owned a restaurant. My grandfather gave me a job working on a logging mill uh, where it literally was so hot and dry in Texas that they had a truck 
driver whose full-time job was to drive over the logging yard and keep the grass, I mean, sorry, the, the dust uh, wet with this truck. It would just water the dust <laughs> so that we could actually work. Um, and then, you know, I, I did some consulting while I was in college uh, with IT because I was very natural with computers, you know, building databases and things like that. Yeah. Um, and then I had a IT support role um, with a company who provided software for the insurance industry, um, moved into some software development and I knew at one point 14 different programming languages could program in eight different databases and knew four different operating systems from that world. And then uh, transitioned into like a CIO type role, got an accidental education in psychology by building a behavioral profile that would be beyond the scope of this interview, but very fascinating what I learned about technology and psychology in that project. Yeah. And then I really got fascinated with culture and culture's impact on business. It's probably one of the single biggest levers that you can pull to impact your success. Um, and so I started, you know, working with people to transition their culture into performance and accountability. And so there, um, you know, began to take that on as more of a corporate mission, if you will, of demystifying success and continuous improvement. And then uh, worked with Daniel Stark which was a personal injury law firm, one of the best run law firms in the country, bar none. Um, we also built Legal Monkeys. It was two employees when I first started. They provided, at first it was software as a service, and then it became service with software um, to make it work right in the industry. Right. And then transitioned into my, at the time, dream job, which was running a startup accelerator at Seed Sumo. And with Seed Sumo, we had a 100-day boot camp for startups. And we would run about 10 teams through a 100-day program. We invested $50,000 in for 10% equity. So we were effectively valuing them at half a million when we got started. And then our goal was to get them through business model validation for a demo day and then help them raise funding and continue. Um, after that, um, that fund made a transition to a different geography that I, I didn't want to follow. So at the time, uh, I had fallen in love with someone and she wasn't going and I wasn't going. And so I chose love and abandoned my dream job to stay and choose this community and have had a consulting practice for the last several years that probably five, six years now that focuses exclusively on helping companies transition past the natural barriers that you find yourself in when you're in a corporate setting. So as we alluded to earlier, that is an enormous breadth of career pursuits and interests. Does that go back to the chaos thing as well? Uh, what, what informs that hugely diverse career path? Well, I mean, I, I think when I heard that man speak, you know, when he, he said, you know, that all the entrepreneurs that he had met and worked with, they, they all were very comfortable with chaos. Yeah. He, he also said, you know that we t we tend to compensate as a form of acceptance um you know sometimes we're doing too much in our businesses and man that chaos statement just rang so true to me and i shared it with a group once as i was speaking you know to i guess several hundred entrepreneurs and there's this weird vibe when i said that and i said hold on a second i said is there anybody here who doesn't resonate with what I just said. And nobody, there wasn't a single person who didn't get it. And, you know, and I realized there was a deeper truth in that. And so when I talk to people, especially people who don't understand entrepreneurship or who struggle with finding success or think it's something and haven't quite realized it's something entirely different. Mm -hmm. It's never what you think it's going to be. And so what I tell people is you're, your chaos or your struggles or your trial, that is the path. That is the path to success. Joseph and, Campbell. Yeah, and I, I wrote a blog about it once of why we like sports. And the reason why I think we like watching sports is because it gives us an illusion that you actually score. Because in business, there is no scoring. You don't score and then the other team you know, gets the ball and we go at it again. You're just constantly moving the ball. And there are these arbitrary markers along the way that if you want, you can celebrate them, but you never really reach a goal. You never really accomplish 
this specific thing, it's constantly in flux. Mm -hmm. uh, sports is also a perfect utopian world where everybody follows the rules. And if you don't, the referees penalize you immediately. And we all agree that that's fair. And that's not how business works. It's just chaotic and out of control. I mean, who in their right mind would have ever taken me seriously as a consultant in my role of saying, okay, guys, check it out. During our strategic planning, what happens if, check this, there's a global pandemic and the government says you can't operate for three months. They would have thought I was crazy in July of last year or January of this year or February. <laughs> it's just, it's crazy. And so you still have to be able to adapt and overcome you can have an amazing employee who does everything that you ever dreamed of. And then guess what? Their family's moving and they don't want to work here anymore. And now you have to start over and there were no systems or documentation and you have no idea how they were good at what they were, but now you have to build and get through that anyway. Right. There's just so much chaos in business that you have to be okay with it and say, this is what's supposed to happen. Now, what do we do in this moment? And instead of putting a team together, maybe, that is expecting things to be a certain way. It's more about people navigate through that with the minimum amount of disruption to your business. Right. You talked about the inability to score in business and I want to push back on that a little bit, but really I just want to push back kind of as a segue to another question. If someone's goal is acquisition and they sell their business and then what, what do they do after that? You've dealt with a lot of business owners who have sold their business, a few that you talked about a moment ago. And uh, what, what then? They usually go into a depression. Post, po it's, there's a, this is a phenomenon in sports also. It's, uh, they, it's referred to as post-championship depression. Yeah. They do. And, then, and then what? It's hard for them to understand they build their identity around their work yeah around being needed um being a part of a team knowing what is expected of you every day as crazy as it may be and unexpected as it may be these are their friends people they care deeply about and they solve meaningful challenges together you understand too, in any work, no matter whether you're an employee or an entrepreneur, you spend more time at work than you do with your family. And you have to talk about tough issues. It's not like a family where you can pretend that they're not happening. Right. Um, and that everything is okay because it's not. And so when they sell the company for the first time in their life, they think, what do I do now? What do I do with my time? And then whoever bought it doesn't run it the way that you did and doesn't value the things that you value and didn't make the decisions you made. They have this other purpose that they're going and there's no place to go. Mm -hmm. And so there's, a, there's an emptiness sometimes in looking for meaning that happens in their life. It's very, a very profound transition. Um, and I didn't even realize this until a couple of years ago, but there is a, there are some psychologists who specialize in treating that, specific condition of people who have sold their business and helping them um, find that meaning again, coming out of that depression, hmm. which is surprising because you think, Hey, you've got a hundred million or $800 million personal wealth. What do you want to do? And which we can talk about that. That's a very well-defined path as well. Um, it's not the money though. It never was the money. Um, that's not why they did it. What, what do they end up doing? Well, the very first thing that happens, um, when you come into great wealth like that, um, especially if you earned it through business, is the first thing that you do is you put it to work and you diversify through investments. Um, and then, so let's say there's an $800 million, you know, after all the taxes or even 80 million, you know, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, gold, real estate, you know, but you diversify and invest that money. Mm -hmm. the, the otherwise, people or they wouldn't have been able to make it to where they are in six and with, without being able to manage money. Well, right. And so, um, they go through a phase of life that Brad Feld, what he calls money, where you basically push back against anyone who's ever told you what you can or can't do. And they'll spend, you know, hundred thousand dollars going on a African safari or, 
I've literally seen uh, a guy who he paid $25,000 for a private flight to bring in lobster to an island because they ran out. You know, it's just little things like that. Cars, experiences, houses. Mm -hmm. So you spend a lot of money on things that are are saying, I I want to indulge a little bit. And then what you realize is I can't spend all this money. And usually this phase takes about, uh, my experience has been 18 to 24 months. And then they realize it didn't change me. It it didn't do anything for me. So now what's next? Right. What do I do with this wealth? And what do I do with my life? And then they transition into the what's next phase of life, which is a responsibility and a burden that they feel with their wealth to say, how can I make a meaningful impact in the world that we live in? This is okay. not talked about in pub- in the public anywhere, not in definitely not in politics yeah. and it's not even in, in the, you know, entertainment movies, TV shows, things like that. They're all, these people are vilified. Um, but what they start doing is investing in things that they care about. And sometimes they'll gravitate towards startups or private equity type things because they want to bring something into the world that would make the world a better place. And mm-hmm. their wealth is um, the kind of the ticket to make that happen. Let's go back to the behavioral profile that you mentioned briefly earlier. I'm a big fan of those kind of things. I love Myers-Briggs. I'm not as much of an Enneagram person. Uh, the Enneagram's really hot right now, and that's not as much my favorite, but I love Myers-Briggs. I enjoyed Strengths Finder. I've taken the Berkman three times. Uh, mm-hmm. I really love career. I still have my uh, motivators sheet from career leader sitting in my little um my little work folder my leather work folder which is very old school nobody has those anymore but i still carry one around and in the front pocket of it is my uh, career leader motivators list nice. i'll show it to you sometime actually i think that would inform our some of the discussions that we've had um but tell us about a little bit about the one that you have worked with. What's what's different about that one? What does it do better? Is there anything it doesn't do as well? Yeah, so the, everything that you just described, um, you'll notice a lot of them like Berkman or Myers-Briggs, you know, they, they all have, you know, usually a name of a person who created them. Um, oh, yeah. And they're, they're all created through an attempt to better explain our world and help us to understand each other. Sure. Enneagram is a big deal right now. And I, I think that has been rebooted through the church community is my understanding. Oh. Um, part of why it has got such widespread acceptance. Right. But, you know, I'm an Enneagram 8 or I'm an Enneagram 3. I'm a 5. So that totally explains everything about me. And that's the goal of any of these tools is to be able to explain us in a way that we can understand and relate better to our world. So this is an older tool that it's not a personality. It's actually a behavioral instrument, which tells you your value system. What I have come to discover is that people have a behavioral language, a behavioral value system. Yeah. So the easy example is let's say you take a married couple. One of the scales that we measure in this tool is the need for order and structure. So you have this kind of classic setup between a husband and a wife where one person really values order, high order, structure. Everything has a home. Everything has a place. The shoes go in the closet. If you make a sandwich, you put the twisty tie back on before you eat anything, and then you put the bread and everything away. And so everything has its home and place and it feels better in that world. And then you have the other person that take the shoes off at the front door, the jacket goes on the chair, uh, they'll never make up the bed and everything is a mess. And what ends up happening is we kind of vilify the other person is you're a neat freak or you're a slob. And what they don't realize is they actually have a different value system of one person is valuing order and structure where the other person is valuing maybe spontaneity and uh, freedom of choice or living in the moment. Mm -hmm. And so that can set up a natural conflict in relationships. And what we do is we have a tendency to see your behavior through my lens. So if a person who's real low order and low structure, what we call the starters of the world, not the finishers, if they were to do what a high order person does, they would think that's a neat freak. That's going crazy. Yeah. And so um, similarly, if you're high autonomy and you need to be alone or you're with a a high nurturing person who needs to be around people, 
if, if the high nurturing person gets their feelings hurt and separates your high autonomy goes, Oh, that's fine. They need time by themselves. No, right. high nurturing people, they don't leave. <laughs> There's something wrong. You need to go chase after them. Okay. The opposite is true. Whereas if your autonomy person is upset and they leave or not upset and they leave and your high nurturer goes, Oh my gosh, you're leaving. There must be a problem. They can right. actually create a problem in the relationship. And we just, we need to understand who we are and the fact that other people are different. They value other things. We work differently. We live differently. And this behavioral tool showcases that for us in a way that it's been difficult to translate the tool, which is some of the work that I did that makes it more accessible for people. But it looks at your behavior and is a predictive instrument, not just descriptive. It's the only predictive instrument I've ever worked with. Um, measures about 38 different individual factors um, and can be used any, anything from hiring and selection, you know, picking an administrative assistant, business partner, um, coaching, job selection, ranking. It, it really has a lot of different uses and applications for it. Mm -hmm. Culture has been described as the single biggest lever of success. What do you have to say about culture and perhaps especially early stage for entrepreneurs? Well, when someone's first getting started? Yeah. Like how should they prioritize culture? Yeah. Um, Michael Dell said for him, if he was to do, do it different, what would he change? He said, early on, I would have focused on the culture. You know, and people say, you know, culture eats execution for breakfast, a lot of things like that. Right. Culture is to to me. If you could just work on one thing, it is the thing that will most likely give you success in business. You know, just period. Right. But the problem is people don't know what it is, and if they don't know what it is, they also don't have the skills around it. And how do you prioritize focusing on something like culture when you feel the constant threat? of getting sales so that you can create revenue just so you can just stay in business and afford to. So there's definitely a, a it's a paradox because you, you really have to have one before the other. But if you want to make your company as good as it can be, you have to invest in culture. You have to protect that. So one thing that I under, understand is culture to me is not foosball tables, beanbag chairs, free lunches. It, that's not it. Those are perks. Those are amenities. And you can say, no, it's our vibe. You know, we like, we work on bouncy balls instead of chairs. That's, that's still not culture. Culture is the practiced and tolerated behaviors in your organization. Right. It's, if look, if, if you're cutthroat and snarky and sarcastic, then own that and say, look, our culture is snarky and sarcastic. And if you don't like it, go somewhere else. If you're loving and kind and supportive and encouraged, then great, be that. But do not be aspirational when you're talking about and defining your culture. But a lot of times, here's what happens with companies that are successful. They accidentally get culture right because they approach hiring differently when they're not trying to scale hiring. So what will happen is your first key hire, the one that really helps you get to a million or get to five million or even just sell the first thing. Right. It happens accidentally. You don't put out an ad in the newspaper and say, I'm looking for this person or add on indeed or on Facebook, you know, you just are talking to someone and you realize, you know what? I like you. I trust you. We work well together. Let's go create a company. Neither one of you are probably qualified to do the thing that you're going to do, but you know that you've got the right culture fit and that you can figure it out and you're scrappy and you do what you need to do and where one's weak, the other's strong. But then when they start hiring, they start asking people to do a job instead of fit a certain behavioral pattern. And so that's when it starts to break down. So sometimes, yeah. you know, to your question, people can accidentally get culture right on the front end, but because they're missing the skill set of how to do it, then it falls away or they grow so fast that they can't protect your culture. You know, you can't grow by 30%. So you have 100 employees, now you have 30 new people. So now you're at 130, which whether the math is 30% or not, I hear you. But now you have these 30 new people that are influencing your, your company. And they're telling you what they think and how they want to behave instead of being indoctrinated and really understanding and coming along and understanding the parts that are important. So right. even if you're a single individual who's just starting out, you have to get the right people in your company. And I'm not saying, look, I have seen examples 
of brutal, ruthless people who per- pursued growth at all costs and left really good people in the dust. I'm not saying you couldn't eventually have been a billionaire. You may have been slower, but you, there's a lot of carnage in your wake and you lost good people that could have been with you if you just would have done it differently. And I've seen nice people accomplish nothing. And so that was hard for me to reconcile. But the cultural component, it matters because we spend so much time at work and we go home to our families and we take work home with us and you create a better environment and you can accomplish greater things. So it's the most important thing to protect, but it is a skill set, and most people don't have it. And so I understand I'm saying go and work on this thing, but nobody knows how to do it or when it is. Um, is if you're just selling a product and you don't care about the brand or the people behind it, I just feel like that's a, a more shallow way of approaching business and it's not as rewarding at a level that really truly matters. And eventually you're going to be standing and looking into that chasm and needing to know how to how to bridge it. So why not build it in when you first get started? Makes sense. Let's talk about Seed Sumo. Okay. You you mentioned earlier that that was your dream job. Why? I was sitting in a parking lot at school. My kids were uh, probably third or fourth grade. Very frustrated with with life at that point, specifically business. And I was talking to a friend on the phone and he said, what's your dream job? And I said, I don't know what it's called, but I can tell you what I think it is. And he yeah. started telling me. And I said, well, um, it's being involved in multiple companies, maybe five to 10 at a very high level, you know, being able to be like an advisor role, but, you know, definitely an equity position and not having to be involved in the day to day monotony of the work, but the things that actually can move the needle and really make them grow and accomplish something specific. Yeah. And he's like, okay. I've never seen that. What's that called? And I said, I don't know either. As far as I know, it's not in the world, but it's in my heart and I can feel it. And the best I had seen was I had heard of a consultant once who would work with companies. And every year that he worked with them, he asked for 1% equity with a maximum of five years. And that way, if he wasn't adding value, then, you know, they could always just let him go and they hadn't lost anything. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's probably the closest thing I know. And what this guy told me was, he said, I know this, if it's in your heart, it's in your future and God is faithful. So keep pressing in. And it was probably 10 years later that uh, I heard about Seed Sumo, which was a startup accelerator here in town. And I knew what they were by studying Paul Graham and Y Combinator, which is probably one of the most, um, probably the most famous. Yeah. Um, and tech stars, you know, did they probably were the first to scale what he did. Um, And then, you know, I heard there was one in town and I said, no, that's not possible. And someone asked me why. And I said, because Brian College Station is not where you put one of those. This is not a location for a startup accelerator. Um, What I didn't know is is who had built it and that it really was here and it was serious. And so I went and asked to speak with Brian, who was was, uh, heading it up. And when our first meeting, he said, you're exactly what we're looking for. And I thought, wow, the standards must be really low here in the early days. <laughs> not a good place for me. Um, and so that's um, when, when, I, when I heard what it was, I had actually already had written a manual. I had already written the playbook for if I was to create a startup accelerator, this is what it would look like. This is how it would work. And so I showed them my plan and they said, okay, you can run it, take it. Um, you know, of all the people who contributed ideas to it, we like the plan that you have and we think this is what will work and it lines up well with our mission and values. And so um, I got started and uh, took over the program and worked with probably 30 or 40 teams over did, years. Before we talk about that, how did you react in that moment? Like what did, what was in your heart? What was in your mind when you walked in and said, uh, I love what you like. This is, as you later said, this ended up being your dream job. You probably had some thought that it might be. You walk in the door, you pitch them your ideas and they say, all right, you can run it. What did you think at that point? How, how did you feel? I felt like I was home. Um, yeah. A lot of emotion in these questions. Um, I, I, there's, if you ever want to just take a minute for inspiration, just go and, and 
YouTube and Google Paul Potts or Andrew Johnston um, and just look at that moment when these two people who really doubted who they were, you know, one was a, a cell phone salesman and the other one was a child who was being bullied in school for singing. And they go out on stage of America's Got Talent, or as in this case, it was Britain's Got Talent. And they, they tell their story and everyone doubts them. And then they, they sing. And just the audience stops and people cry and they applaud and they cheer. And there was something about that moment of saying, I finally found my stage. I, I wasn't wrong about all the things that I believed I was capable of or that I wanted to do or that were in my heart. And the voice of doubt that I allowed in that was given to me sometimes by people who were closest to me and who were supposed to have protected me and helped and encouraged me, who didn't, who doubted. That moment on the stage where they were, they found that validation, if you will. I always respected that and always looked for that. And to know that the world has a place for you, no matter how crazy your ideas are. And in this moment, I was on the stage and the audience applauded. That's what it felt like to me. And so part of it was surreal in that, is this really happening? Are these guys messing with me? <laughs> or do I really get to do this? And professionally, it was some of the most rewarding time in my entire life. And, but at that moment, it was very special. Thank you for asking that. Of course. Thanks for answering. Um, and then, but this is, in, in a way, it's, uh, it's almost like American Idol, though, in that you actually get a record deal and that you, get to, you get to start doing this for a living. Yeah, absolutely. And then you get to give that opportunity to other people. Yes. And you know, we would see 1,200 startups a year who walked across our stage uh, who, who wanted to be the 10 that we chose to work with. Right. But, uh, you know, obviously it was a very selective process. What was the, what was the most interesting investment decision that you made while you were there? Maybe, or the most interesting investment decision and the most interesting decision not to invest? Well, that's the key is what not to invest in. What a lot of people don't realize is whenever you set up a fund and you commit to investing in something, you usually put all of that money to work, which means that if, if you're going to invest $5 million or $50 million or $500,000, you are going to spend it all on investments. Um, and so it finally made sense of a comment I had heard where someone said, for me to invest in you, you don't have to be good. Just be the least bad thing that I've seen today. Hmm. I never really fully understood that until we got into investing. And you realize the concept of stack ranking and, and how that can have an impact on what you invest in and what you don't. Um, the Probably the most interesting, I'm glad you asked interesting and not successful because it's definitely a, a, a different world. Um, so if you think about a rapper, like what comes to mind when you imagine a rapper, like there may be a specific person like Tupac or, um, maybe Eminem, even if you go that route. Yeah. I think it's Jay-Z for me. Like he's, he's the one who's been with me, with us for 20, 20, not quite 25 years, I guess, but close to it. Okay. And so if a Jay-Z, for example, was to create a company, who would Jay-Z bring with him? You know, maybe his, his production crew and all of his people. And you get a mental picture of what you think that might be. So we actually invested in a startup once that their product was rap and specifically rap battles. And so there was an app they had developed where a person could go on and challenge another person to actually battle against them in a, a rap environment. Now, it wasn't like true live freestyling. You actually had some time to craft your response. But once they challenged you, there was a clock running and you had a certain amount of time to craft your rap battle against them. It's very aggressive and very insulting. Um, and sometimes they very rarely do they build each other up. It's more about tearing each other down. <laughs> And so when you think, okay, we're going to meet the CEO of this rap battle app, it was not Jay-Z. It was a white girl from Russia. And she had these very scrawny, nerdy white guys and white women from Russia, from the cold, brutal, 
you know, <laughs> conditions of the Soviet Union. But they had built this amazing app that had, you know, hundreds of thousands of people on it just battling each other all the time. Um, it defied everything that I ever really thought, you know, that we were going into. Um, cause she was so nice. She was so sweet. Um, but they, um, they really embraced that culture and, and love music and specifically this form of music. I want that app just so I control people. <laughs> I wouldn't even like actually rap battle them. I would just be like the rap battle on YouTube. I broke up with my ex-girlfriend. Here's a number. Psych. That's the wrong number. <laughs> You have to have a, you got to get a good title uh, for you. Um, like what gamers would call your, your uh, handle. You need a good, yeah. gamer tag, good gamer tag, a rapper tag. Mine would involve the word troll for sure. <laughs> yeah. Although maybe that's too on the nose. So you guys did invest in that or you didn't? We did. Um, one that I was potentially most proud of um, that it was when they got away actually was yeah. there there was a, a group of people from China who were working on this. I always love when the problem begins, they tell me the problem. They don't tell me what they're working on. So I was interviewing a billionaire for a project once. Then I asked him, how did you make your money? And he said, do you know how eggs are fragile? And I said, yes, I do know how eggs are fragile. He said, well, I was a chemistry major and I invented the egg carton, the little foam egg carton that keeps eggs from breaking because they're fragile. And every time someone buys a carton of eggs, I make a little money and we buy a lot of eggs. So I made a lot of money. And I thought, I love that description. And so this group was telling us in China, um, whenever you have a pet and you need to take your pet to the vet, because not many people have access to vehicles, you have to take public transportation and pets aren't allowed on public transportation. So it's very difficult to just get your pet into a veterinarian. So what they wanted to do was to create one of the first, you know, like mo not mobile, but an app based or video based veterinarian health in China, because there were so many people, so many pets, it was a huge unmet need. And what we were looking for is at the time we were sifting through finding startups and founders. And it was during spring break and a lot of people were busy on spring break. And I told my partners, I said, this is good. They're naturally sifting themselves out. I want the people who are working on spring break, who are using this time to refine their business and not go take it easy. Yeah. And I found them, um, they actually came from A&M, which was, um, was really encouraging. Um, I was mentoring a three day startup even in this group was still there working and wouldn't yield their office space to three-day startup because they had stuff to do. I'm like, those are my people. <laughs> I want to believe in those guys. Yeah. And they had a great idea and were working on it and doing well. <clears throat> and then um, they got, and I said, you know, I can help them. And I have a, a very emotional story about them. If you want, I can share, but they, um, yes, they, so early on the, the founder was getting a lot of grief from his parents. And I guess, I would say culturally that the, the Chinese maybe are not as adventurous or risk tolerant as maybe the American culture is was what I was deducing from this. Yeah. And they were giving him a lot of pushback for not taking a job because he was very well educated and very accomplished. And I said, tell me what the problem is. And he said, my parents don't believe in entrepreneurism. I said, well, then let me talk to them. And so he agreed to translate and I talked to the parents about this issue and I asked them, what is your favorite company in the world? And they named, you know, like Itachi or Honda. There were some, some companies from their, their culture that they really loved and believed in. And I said, would it be a great honor for your son to work at one of these com companies? And then of course he's translating and they would say, yes, it would be a great honor to work in a big company like that. And I said, each of the companies that you've named is named after the founder you realize that, right? And they said, yes. And I said, each of the companies that you mentioned was started by a single person. Someone who had vision to create a different kind of company that could employ people and create opportunities that you say would be a great opportunity for your son. Do you understand this? And they said, yes. And I said, I want you to understand that at one point that company didn't exist. It began in the heart of a founder, someone who was taking great risk and was willing to do something different to create something better for other people. Your son is one of those men. And he didn't translate that. He just stopped and looked at me. And I said, tell them what I just said. This is very important. 
I said, you are someone that's worth believing in and you're trying to do something really important in this world. And I need them to understand that you're following a path that they respect. They just haven't recognized it yet. And he did. He told them, told them what I said. And the mom, she started to cry. And for the first time in the conversation, I could see pride in the eyes of the father. And I thought, this was a good conversation. <laughs> it's a good conversation. So to quote The Last Samurai, this has been a good conversation. And what ended up happening was they actually got behind him and supported him. And then he got picked up by the founder of Alibaba. <laughs> so... <laughs> I think they went where they really belonged. Um, you know, they were a Chinese company with a Chinese culture. They they spoke Chinese. Every single web page was in Chinese. There was not there was no English component to it. And so I was saying, for us to really serve them and help them, they really need to be in China with a Chinese support group. You know, but I, I didn't know we didn't have anybody in that network we could connect them with. Right. Eventually, he found basically it was the Chinese equivalent of Paul Grant. Um, you know, so the founder of Alibaba had really deep pockets, a great mentor network, a really strong accelerator program. It was the Y Combinator of, of that country. And so I felt really good about losing them to that place. You know, and in retrospect, if our time together was just so I could have had that conversation with his parents, it was definitely worth the time that we spent with them. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you for asking. You told us how the seed sumo journey came to an end for you since what's that kind of um the i, w I went to we were going to move um to austin uh, right. because two two reasons one is startup founders want lifestyle uh, and you might translate lifestyle as dating scene and brian call station is not a destination location for pretty much anybody it's a place to come back to it's not a place to go to for fun and excitement but austin is and so we were losing some really top tier company we were looking for the best companies in the world because we have the best mentors in the world right and, but they wanted to be in you know silicon valley or austin or things like that the other thing is you don't invest in startups unless you've exited and there's not a lot of people who've sold their companies um, who live in Brian Call Station. So there were more uh, in investors in Austin as well. Plus the founders of Seed Sumo wanted to be back in that community because that's where they were from. Um, and so we were, there was this discussion around when do we go, you know, when, where are you going to live and all those kind of things. And I went to dinner with a lady that was dating my business partner and his wife. And they asked the question of, are you guys excited about going to Austin? What do you think about it? And I generically answered, she generically answered. And then three months later, they asked me the question of, are you going or not? Because apparently I was showing some hesitation. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, no, I'm actually not. I think I'm going to stay. And my business partner, he was like, damn it, my wife told me this was going to happen and I didn't believe her. And I said, what happened? He said, well, three months ago when we went to dinner on the way home, my wife said, Steve's not going to Austin. Mm. Like, yes, he is. Of course he is. He is Seed Sumo. We're a team. He's going. She's like, no, you missed something in that meeting in the, in the dinner. She said, that woman's not going to Austin and he's in love with her. So he'll choose her. He's not coming with you. And he said, I didn't believe it until now, but it's like, I got to know, are you coming or not? I was like, no, I can't. I'm going to choose love. I can find another job, but you don't find your soulmate every day. And so that's how I've decided to stay here and choose, you know, the Brian College Station community, which I really love. It's a great community, a lot of really good businesses, a lot of good opportunity, great place to raise a family. Um, and I, I chose, I chose this instead. I didn't even know at the time, I guess. <laughs> but follow your heart. It's part of business. Let's talk about the let's talk about the after of that. You've served as a, an independent consultant. How, how would you describe your career arc since then? Okay, so a lot of times, you know, people ask you sometimes just in a in passing, you know, what do you do? Um, and what I would like to do instead is like, if I can tell you an example of what I do instead of the title that may help you better. Right. Uh, and then 
the every every business gets to a point where it's stuck and it just can't grow. Um, it, it's not reaching the vision and the capability of what the founder can see that they know is possible. Okay. Sometimes that's because of marketing or sales problems. Um, sometimes it's because there's a leadership gap at the top. Um, and then, you know, sometimes it's because there's not a good culture that supports that kind of growth or there's been hiring problems or they don't have the right strategy. And so what I do is I help people grow past those barriers and start growing again. Now you can call that a business coach or a business consultant. I personally don't like the word consultant and I've noticed that our market and clients don't like the word either. Hmm. Um, so the word can get in the way of what you really do for people. But what I help people do is to build the company that they believe is possible. You know, for me, my mission is that business success shouldn't be a mystery. And so it's been about demystifying success and then being the mentor that I wished I would have had. Hmm. To that end, if we, if we frame you as a, a business advisor, what, what are your greatest talents? What are, what are you doing that other business advisors or consultants, if that's the title that they choose, what are you doing that they're not doing? Or what are you doing better than others are doing? I ask amazing questions and have the best analogies of anybody I've ever met. I think I, if I was to answer maybe more traditionally, which is not my strength, is my probably greatest strength in that role is helping people see things differently. You know, that they usually I hear this phrase when I'm talking to someone. I never thought of it that way before. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's what I do. I, I, I can help you see things differently because see, and understand in my world, there are no boundaries. I don't see the end. I can see past the end or I can, can see the world through a different lens with pieces put together and reconfigured in a different way. Yeah. And so the boundaries that other people see, sometimes it's because I'm wired different and don't see them. And other times it's because I'm not emotionally invested in the decision that you've made. So I haven't accepted what you consider a limitation or my life experience has taught me that there's another way to do this. Mm. Or sometimes it's just kind of a crazy idea, a short in the brain, if you will, that I'm, I've been blessed with thinking differently, being crazy level of insanity in terms of like creativity, just overwhelming me of curiosity that I couldn't control of needing to understand and answer things that on the surface looked like they made sense, but then really didn't if you dig deeper. Mm -hmm. And so I, I bring that level of thought um, to other people, which was, was hard. It was hard for me because it was out of control curiosity, but for other people it actually causes them to be able to focus and find the truth behind what they're trying to do. You mentioned a second ago, not seeing boundaries. And for that reason, you've, kind of gravitated to the role of the visionary in yes. business and there's also an integrator role. Can you talk about the difference between those two and what our listeners should be considering with respect to those roles? Sure. So the term uh, vocabulary is very important because it lets you talk about concepts in a more meaningful way. Um, Gino Wickman with his book Traction, he talks about the and articulates these two roles pretty clearly. Um, the visionary is the one who kind of has been to the other side of the mountain and sees what's possible and has an idea in their heart of what they want to do in the world. Now, maybe they don't always have the, the way they just know where they're going. They know they're going to get there. Now the, the integrator is the person who takes that vision and makes it more of a reality. That's the person who's willing to do the work that forces resolution when it's necessary, helps put the team together. You can think of it as the starter and the finisher. So the visionaries are more likely to be starters and you can recognize them in that when they're having a conversation, maybe they're all over the place. Um, it's not just monkey brain, but they'll have 10 ideas, but they only go one level deep. And that's the blessing is because they don't see all the connection, they see possibility. Right. When an integrator enters the room, they're like, oh, hold on a minute. You just said 10 things. 
I'm going 10 levels deep on that first thing you were talking about. Slow down a minute. And they understand that everything has a, a connection. There's an order, there's a structure. And that if we're going to have a good event or a good anything, there has to be timelines and structure and order and people are involved and they need to be told what they're doing and know how to do it well. And so they bring a lot of the stability to the table. Um, Cause if you just have a visionary, you'll go out of business and the visionaries will tell you that. But if, because they, they can't bring any kind of structure to the business where it can survive and thrive. But if you just have the integrator, they'll go out of business because they never in innovate. But you put those two together and you can create tension. I'll use the analogy of the tent is that a tent only works because the tent poles put pressure and pull the canvas apart. If there's too much pressure from the tent poles and it rips the fabric and it'll fall. If there's not enough uh, tension, then it'll just fall flat. But the, the proper amount of tension creates a living space that we call a tent. It's the same in a business. The visionary and the integrator will always be at odds with one another, but the tension is what makes it work. I like that. I like that. A couple again, more questions. Together. If you just have the stick, then, you know, the poles are just a pile of sticks on the ground. You know, if you just have the fabric, it's a, it's a mat. You know, they, they need each other. Yeah, yeah. If someone were to look back through your personal history, what's the connection between your history and your skill set that would make them say, wow, what's the, what's the most striking thing there? You, I mean, broad brush, you talked about the chaos yeah. and how that informs it, but let's get more specific. Probably my experience as a world ranked competitive gamer would probably be the, the wow. Um, the, I affectionately refer to it as coming out of the basement because <laughs> everyone naturally assumes if you're successful as a gamer, you live in your mom's basement and you have no job and you're unmarried. I'm not sure why those specific insults seem to just naturally flow out of people. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they do. But they do. What did you what did you do with your guild or your clan? Oh well so I was playing a game that had, you know, probably over its lifetime, I don't even know how many, you know, millions of people played it, but they looked at it as simultaneous, you know, around 15 million people at one time playing the game. Yeah. And there, there was one of the first gaming companies that recognizes that games are better when we play them together. So instead of doing something by yourself, they really facilitated the connection with other people. And there were a lot of game elements that were designed that were impossible to win by yourself. Some, you needed five or 10 people or 15 people to win some 20 and their biggest um, adventures, if you will, required 40 people to complete a specific task. Yeah. Um, and so what somebody figured out how to hack into the game and see the gear that you were wearing. And they knew that if you were wearing say this one specific helmet or shield or weapon, it came from this one specific boss and there was a time code of when that happened. So they created a ranking system basically by hacking into what they called the armory or looking at character profiles. Very fascinating. Hmm. And so now with this ranking system, we knew when you did something. And so there was an order of who had done it first. Well, I could never break into like the top 5,000 in the world with our group. And I had to use my own business knowledge to figure out why my organization, if you will, was performing so poorly. And I traced everything back to the root cause, which was with me as a leader, there was no, uh, no penalty for poor performance. Hmm. I believed in people. I was the nice guy. I was the one who encouraged people. And the reality is that doesn't drive performance very well. Right. It actually creates an environment of mediocrity. And so the good players wouldn't tolerate that because they came to win. And the bad players had found a home where they, they would be encouraged and they felt better about themselves. But we weren't accomplishing our mission. And so I had to go through some, some pretty radical transformation um, and you know, eventually was able to, to join up with a group that was more aligned than me. Mm -hmm. uh, they were a little farther advanced already. And on the first night, after watching them play, I said to the, to the guild leader, I said, if you would let me make one change, I think I could break us into the top 100 in the U.S. And he said, okay, we'll do it. And I thought that was very bold to trust someone like that because there was a lot at stake. 
and I know it sounds silly saying that about a game, but it was so much more because it was a leadership laboratory for me. It wasn't just a game. And so we made that change and we broke into not only the top 100 in the U S we broke in the top 100 in the world. So we finished 42nd U S 84th world for the first time. And then eventually went on to be ranked number eight in the world. And we knew the top 20, 30 teams in the world. And we were the only ones that had a limited rating schedule. Um, The other guys would, they would play literally 20 hours a day. They would call in sick to work or uh, skip school whenever there was new content released. And we didn't do that. So we were very efficient about what we did. And I, I mean, I approached it the same way I would approach business. You know, we looked at failures and we analyzed those from a very logical perspective and then put systems in place that helped us succeed and overcome the natural limitations of the game or um, even human behavior. So you were the top ranked out of the basement clan in the world. Amen. <laughs> tell us, tell us about the blue letter behind you. All right. So this is the letter R from Toys R Us. And it's a great, to me, the letter R represents a tombstone um, of what's going to happen if you don't stay relevant in the marketplace. Because the last time I checked, little kids still play with toys and their moms and dads still buy toys for them. So can you please explain to me, how is this possible that Toys R Us went out of business? Yeah. And when I found out they were going out of business, I want you to understand, just so people on can really get this. They didn't just file bankruptcy and reorganize. They sold the fixtures that the toys were sitting on. They, everything went out of business. And we heard that, you know, I said, I want the letter R to remind myself that I need to stay relevant in my business as well, because I don't want that tombstone to be mine. Because if Toys R Us can go out of business, when people use those products, then what chance do I have of creating something that would be more relevant than the joy of a kid and playing with a toy? And what people I don't don't think realize is Toys R Us didn't just sell toys. They had data on what toys were selling. Like why didn't, why didn't they partner innovate with the, the manufacturers or their own suppliers and say, Hey, people seem to be buying more of this and less of that and naturally iterate their shelves, change the design of the store to be more, welcoming, more inviting for, for children. You know, I, I didn't grow up in a town that had one, but as a kid, I had been inside of Toys R Us and the one here in my hometown is exactly the same. After 20, 30, 40 years, there was no innovation within that company. And as a result, they eventually lost. And you can blame Amazon if you want for selling the same toys and getting it there in two days, but they could have gone online too. So why didn't they? Was it a leadership gap? Did they have the wrong people? Were they not asking the right questions? Were they not doing the right work? You know, only they know for sure. But I can tell you a story that I know the truth of an American legend, a worldwide empire that was crushed. And I know the story of that and it's similar. And that's the story of Kodak. Um, We were working on a project with a company where we we actually were using this behavioral profile for coaching and development. And we were looking at transformation of a culture project. And a lot of the executives at this company came from Kodak. And I'd always been very interested in their decline. And I actually, I I told the guys once, I said, we finished our professional obligation. And I said, now that that's done, I have a personal favor to ask you. And he said, what is it? And I said, well, you were there. What happened? So, like Kodak was, it was like a, this American institution. It was, it was powerful. You controlled. I don't. I don't even have a word for how big it is. You know, mm-hmm. Kodak was an empire. You know, a worldwide empire. And he said, "Oh, you don't know the half of it." He said, "He said you have to understand." He said at Kodak, we didn't just control film. We didn't just own that. He said, we owned the moment. The phrase, it was a Kodak moment. It was so incredibly powerful. And I said, so tell me what happened, what went wrong? And he said, you may not know this, but in the early days of digital, Kodak was on the leading forefront. We were ahead of everyone on digital and we knew it was coming. They built the first kiosk and they had put this kiosk in a test market in Australia. 
And it was going just gangbusters. They said it was so well received that the guy who had bought the rights to it wanted the rights for the entire country. He wanted all over every bit of Australia. He wanted, he wanted to own the rights for all of it. And then the project got canceled. Why? The guy who canceled it said, this is going to kill film. And he said, you just can't imagine how profitable film was as a product. Yeah. And he said, when it kills film, it'll kill Kodak. And he said, I will not be the first rock in the avalanche that kills this company. So he canceled the project, even though it was being successful, even though it was leading the industry. And even though that's the way the industry was going, he just didn't, I don't know. I would, I would call it cowardice. They weren't willing to be brave and say, this is what's coming. What do we do about it? Hmm. I will not be the first rock when you have the lunch that kills this company. I'll remember that for the rest of my life. Yeah. It's very, very powerful. You know, I mean, how many people would have given anything just for the opportunity to be in that, that position. Right. And now who knows anything about Kodak except old people. Let's move to some, some rapid fire. Um, what do you consider your most valuable failure? It was a real estate project that I did. We called it Renovate Texas, where we would buy properties and flip them. Yeah. And it was doing great in some ways and poor in others. It was the first time in my career where I was unchecked and no one could tell me what to do. Yeah. And I don't know that I would have listened anyway. And I invested in the wrong properties because I believed in something. Um, and I wasn't taking feedback from the market. And I was very arrogant. And I was pressing in in a very reckless way and I failed and yeah. it taught me some very viable lessons. What do you think is people's biggest misconception of you? That, um, hair that looks like this is easy. <laughs> you wake up looking like this every day. <laughs> if you could have anyone as a mentor for one day, who would it be? It's hard to say because it, you know, from day to day it varies, but I, I'll tell you that every day, my clients are my greatest mentors. I, I learned so much more from them than they learned from me, I believe. Um, it's not just the guy who wrote the book or the lady who's on stage speaking to thousands of people that has something to teach us. It, it's our neighbors and people who are in the trenches every day, grinding it out, not knowing the answer and doing it anyway. Um, you know, doing what, everyone else says is it possible and doesn't understand when they tell you to quit and get a real job. Those are my mentors and I learn from them all the time. And if I could pick one on purpose, you know, obviously there's a lot of great names and it, it depends on the day. Um, but fortunately I, I already have those. Everyone has something worth sharing with the world. That's so true. What is the most important advice you would give to yourself exactly five years ago? You know, I've been giving myself advice for a, for a long time. I think it's a lesson that I've, I probably have, have always known, but just a reminder that you, you really just have to, to, to pick the people. Like it's first who, then what. Just make sure you've got the right team. And then, you know, that, life is meant to be lived with other people that there's been a slow evolution in my life of falling in love with people. Um, yeah. from, from early on thinking if you want it done right, you got to do it yourself. Yeah. Or there, you can't count on anybody but yourself. I learned those lessons the hard way in life as a child. And I had to break them as an adult and learn not only to trust other people, but to care about them and love them and to realize it's not about me, it's about them and helping them accomplish their goals and their visions is way more rewarding than anything I would ever hold as a goal for myself. And so yeah, five years ago would just have been a reminder to continue to press into that and continue to, to support and nurture other people and know that that's m way more fulfilling than anything I'm trying to accomplish as an individual. Hmm. Do you have anyone you would like to send good bull? Yeah, it's all the entrepreneurs. Um, I've done a lot of work over the years with female entrepreneurs that have their own, you know, unique struggles uh, in the world, but it's not just them. It, it's the person who says, I believe this is possible 
and then is willing to do it. Um, when their family's telling them to get a job or get a real job. Um, because if, if you believe that you can do something, I'm not telling you that you can. Um, somebody asked Elon Musk, well, what would you, what would you tell yourself if you could go back to beginning and tell the first version of you? And he would say, don't do it. It's too hard. It's way harder than you imagine, you know? Um, but those people do it anyway. And I'm not saying you've got to be an Elon Musk character. It's anyone who's trying to do anything, even a kid who wants to make a little extra money by mowing yards just so they can buy ice cream on the weekend because their parents won't buy it for them. You know, those are the people that I think are to because they're the ones who are creating opportunity in the world that creates revenue, that creates tax dollars, that drives our economy and gives us jobs so that we can provide for our families. And there's nothing wrong with being the employees too, because they, they work in those places. And sometimes your gift and talent is to create something. And sometimes it's to help someone else create something and thank God for the diversity. But the, the people that I believe in professionally and personally, and that I, I send my well wishes to are the ones who are brave enough and bold enough to do it when there is no pattern. And sometimes there's not even any support or encouragement that's deserving of my respect. Absolutely. Steve, this was a good conversation. A good conversation. Thanks for taking the time. You're welcome. Thank you. For our Mastercast top three takeaways, I wanted to first talk about post-championship depression. We've actually talked about it a few times on the show in a lot of different contexts, sports championships, but certainly around the business concepts. But certainly also even around Hari shared post-championship depression after he got tenure, Hari Srihar, on his episode. And Steve talked about it in the context of when someone builds their identity around a business and that business is sold, the depression that they oftentimes experience. Yeah. I mean, good bull to John Elliott, who was the person that introduced me to the concept of post-championship depression. And really what the nugget of it is, the, the kernel of truth at the core of evaluating and understanding post-championship depression is that when your life is wrapped up in just one thing, then after you get that one thing, assuming you're fortunate enough to get it, your life may feel purposeless. And the real conclusion is that you just have to keep perspective on things and you have to consider, is it really worth making my entire life about just this? Yeah, I agree. I think I think that's wise to say. I also think that we have to be very careful about saying, when I get there, I will be happy. Right. When I get there, I will feel this way because I think a big part of the problem is that the championship doesn't really actually feel quite as good as you thought it would be or it doesn't fix. It doesn't fix all the other things that are going on in life. And so yeah. we think that's what's going to make me happy, but we haven't worked on anything else because like you said, we've had this singular focus and then it doesn't really make us that happy. We got a we got a publisher for our book, which is really exciting. But I told I told my family like I was I just happened to be on the phone with my sister when I got the text and I was like, oh, we got a, a publisher for our book deal. And she's like, OK, cool. And then went on to like just kept talking. And then I was on the phone with my parents. and I was like, oh, hey, by the way. And, and my granddad, I was like, oh, hey, by the way, I got we got a publisher. And, and they were like, oh, yeah, cool. So tomorrow we're going to go, you know, like just totally glossed over it. And I was like, man, this is a family that keeps you humble. Like, this is kind of a big deal, people. But we were watching this movie this weekend, Dan in Real Life. Have y'all seen that? I've heard of it. It's super cute. It. It's great. Kyle's nodding his head. He's seen it. Go watch it, people, if you haven't seen it. But it was really cute. And when he gets, he gets like a syndic, he's a journalist, he gets a syndication deal. And the, his parents like ring this bell and gather everyone around to make this announcement. <laughs> and I was like, that's how you do it, people. Like, don't just ignore this accomplishment. But I will say, I think that that actually has served me well, like that my family 
is like, okay, cool. Now we're going to move on because it's just no one thing is the thing, right? It's no one accomplishment is going to make or break our life. It, and no no accomplishments, period, are going to make or break our life. It really is more about how we make people feel, what emotional contributions we make to those people that we love. And I think when we get really focused on, well, when this happens, I will feel this way. When whatever, insert whatever you want for championship, it's it's a very dangerous expectation that never, ever gets fulfilled. Right. It's It's kind of a teammate of mine from college, who was also a graduate assistant uh, with Rice at one point, Joe Hornberger said of watching game tape afterwards, he said, here's the first thing to understand. It's never as good as you think. And here's the second thing to understand. It's never as bad as you think. And watching game tape after he said that, it was so like it, I, I had that guidance in my mind the rest of the time that I watched game tape for my entire football playing and coaching career. And it was true. And you were always surprised by things that were unexpectedly good. And you were always surprised by things that were unexpectedly not as good. And the next day, the sun rises. And, and no one really cares, right? Or or the next thing takes over it so fast. Like you can't live your life on that one great play because there's right. another great play. I, I think, was it Clowning or Clowny? What was his name? Who He had that major hit in college. He was a football player. He ended up playing for the Texans. Yeah, he's still he's still in the league. You know what I'm talking about, though? He, he had that hit in college, like right at the end, right about when he was about to go into the league. And people talked about it for a long time. And this is a great example because I'm talking about it and you're looking at me like, I don't know what you're talking about. Because I mean, no, I've seen the play. Yes. But like no one cares anymore, right? It's just, I mean, there's another great play that comes after it. You can't, we think it's so important or it feels important and you, you gotta, you gotta get up and do the next play. Yeah. I mean, even if you, you know, if you, the most extreme cases of this, you know, hitting a home run to win the World Series, you know, Joe Carter or Bill Mazeroski, those guys in certain places will never have to buy a drink for the rest of their lives. But I mean, that's kind of the extent of it. You know, you you have this this one event. And in some cases, it may even be, you know, it may even become a, kind of a source of annoyance. There's this one thing that defines you and everyone you meet says, I saw that thing that you did. And you're like, that's not my life. Uh, there, there's a there's hundred other things that I've done. So be careful for wishing for one, you know, amazing accomplishment because or, or you know, one great movie role you know elijah wood has done so much stuff but everybody knows him as frodo baggins for the rest of his life forever yeah um so yeah, that's just good be, be careful what you wish for folks for our second takeaway steve really emphasized the importance of establishing culture within an organization early on in a in a startup organization that focusing on culture is so important and he said it's hard for people because they either don't know what culture is or they don't have the skills to in, be intentional about creating that culture. I just think that's an important reminder for people as they're thinking about either starting a business or even moving into a new role that we get so busy. You know, a startup would be so focused. He said a startup would be so focused on revenue that they don't take the time to focus on culture or you're moving into a new role at work and you're so focused on learning the job that you don't focus on culture. And we know mm -hmm. how important culture is, but oftentimes either don't know exactly what to do about it. We know how important culture is, but oftentimes we don't know exactly what to do about it. Or we get so busy that we forget to really give it the attention that it needs. Yeah. It's hard to know how much time is too much time mm -hmm. and how much time is not enough. And many, I would say most companies end up not spending enough time on culture. And it's sort of easy to see why that happens. Culture, whether you're doing it well or poorly, it's hard to measure objectively. And there's not an immediate short term, we make more money tomorrow than we did today because we got our culture figured out. It's an investment. Mm -hmm. And so the difficulty of measurement, it's hard to measure the return on it. And it's hard to measure your performance in it, you know, both the performance and then what that performance gives you. So it's, you know, a lot of companies just kind of end up sacrificing it. Yeah, absolutely.
For our last MasterCast top three takeaway, I just wanted to ask what has been the most helpful thing that you've learned from Steve in getting to work with him? I think y'all have been hanging out with Steve for what, six months or so, maybe? Four months? I don't know. It's COVID time. It could be like six years. I'm not really sure. But you've been hanging out with him for some number of months now. What is the most impactful thing you've learned from him? Steve is you know, really incredible at a lot of different things. But I think the process of discovery and of figuring out how to think about a market and how to think about what a, what a potential customer or client is thinking about and the, and the job that they want done, the problem that they want addressed. You know, Steve has a ton of great questions, but getting into the mind of the person that you're trying to add value for, that's the key to the whole game. And if you can do that, you know, the whole lean process is built around that. And Steve does that as well as anyone. And figuring out that both the art and the science of asking the right questions and really listening to the answers. And then in the process of really listening, figuring out the next right question. Steve does that as well as anyone I've ever met. And um, it's been a pleasure to learn from him. That's awesome. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, Ben and Kyle, for introducing us to Steve. It was a really interesting. Of course. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Ben, you want to close us with a quote? It's a brief one. When a truly great and unique spirit speaks, the lesser ones must be silent. Reiner Rilke. An MBA from Texas A&M University can take your career to a whole new level. With full-time and weekend options, Texas A&M suits your schedule. So get a better gig. Visit mba.tamu.edu.